cancer touches all of us. That's the message. And when it touches us, we have the ability to do things using our unique talents. And I think one of the exciting things is the gentlemen that are joining us on stage today. Um, and so to start us off, you can read about them in your program. You can read about them in journals. You can read about them on the internet. But, you know, I think that it's important for you to know who they are. And so, um, Marty, I'm going to let you go first because you're as, you are our honored out-of-town guest. And um, my first question is, you know, let us know a little bit about you. You know, who are you? What are you doing? And why does this matter? First, excuse me. First of all, I, I want to thank uh, you and Arizona Bio and uh, Arizona State University for the opportunity to come down here. I came down to enjoy a few days of sun. And uh, what I got was this wonderful smell that happens after a rain. Uh, and, and I very much appreciate the opportunity because there's some incredible things coming going on here. Uh, I was uh, very happy in my career as a computer scientist. I was teaching at Stanford. I had started one of the uh, earliest uh, internet uh, commerce uh, startups. In fact, I believe I did the first commercial transaction on the internet and done with a credit card. Netscape. I'm sorry. I hate to interrupt you, but we can't hear you. Can you keep the microphone closer? Yeah. Button. Sorry. Okay, you can hear? Uh, I, I, I was bragging about uh, something I believe uh, I did uh, somewhere along the line was do the first internet uh, commerce transaction with a credit card. Netscape was a spin-off of my company. Uh, and then I went on to something even bigger, a company called Commerce One, uh, which if for those of you remember the dot-com meltdown. Anyway, in the middle of all of that, uh, I discovered a lump under my arm. Uh, which uh, my doctor uh, was convinced was I must have scraped myself and I had a swollen lymph node or something like that. Uh, after four to six months, I told the doctor, I want to know what that is, and I demanded that it be taken out. And all of a sudden, uh, I, was, uh, I heard these dreaded words that uh, no one wants to hear, you have cancer. And uh, that changed all of my priorities in an instant. Uh, and here was my experience. I was just not diagnosed with cancer. I was diagnosed with cancer, melanoma, metastatic to liver, which uh, 15 years ago or so uh, was a death sentence. Uh, it literally was uh, you know, single digit uh, percentage of people who would survive a diagnosis like that. And I went around to get second opinions and everyone gave me the same uh, you know, dire news prognosis. But everyone was telling me something different to try. And if I had listened to any of the local oncologists that I had talked to, I would be dead now. I was fortunate at the time I was uh, doing some pro bono consulting for Rick Klausner, who was running the National Cancer Institute. And I said, Rick, I need your help. Uh, what, what, uh, what do you guys got going? What are you funding? And he introduced me to a whole new level of uh, uh, doctors and physicians and researchers who had some very interesting things going on. And I asked each of them, uh, what should I do? And everyone had a different uh, suggestion. Well, it doesn't look good, but here's what you should try. And I just really threw up my hands at that point, and I said, if somehow I can get through all of this, uh, I'm going to uh, do something about it using my skills as a computer scientist and an internet entrepreneur because we can do better. We can capture the data that will allow people to make rational decisions in times like this. Ultimately, I uh, bet my life on a clinical trial, which failed. But it helped a small minority of patients, and I was fortunate to be among them. And at that point, I really redoubled my, my vow and I said, I, I was saved for a reason, and I'm going to do something about it. And that's why I'm here. It's why I started an organization called Cancer Commons uh, with the very simple objectives of, number one, uh, giving patients the information that they need to try to get better outcomes. 
to learning as much as possible from each patient so that we're continually testing and refining that knowledge. And then to disseminate that knowledge as fast as possible, real-time information sharing, real-time learning, as opposed to what goes on in the academic journals, which can in involve a year of lag time with each paper. So you can imagine published, so you can imagine if I can't do any work till the next paper gets published and so on, that science is held back. Uh, and more importantly, the patients are falling farther and farther behind the wavefront of, of scientific progress. And that was simply unacceptable. And it's something that we can absolutely do something about. Thank you, Marty. And Josh, you've been attacking this problem from a different direction. Okay, uh, do, you want me to, do you want me to talk about the direction of our science or well, just a little bit of background of my science? A little bit about you yeah. first. So um, I, I should mention that uh, I grew up just about three miles, if you go due north of here on 7th Street, just around where it, where it intersects with Glendale. So I'm a local guy. Uh, did all of my sort of uh, young schooling here in Arizona. Mm -hmm. Um, and then left the state, which at the time I perceived at least as being a little bit backward, let's say. Um, uh, it's changed a lot since then, but I headed uh, off to California where I did my undergraduate work at Berkeley. And really what happened for me at Berkeley was the recognition, not only did I for a long time want or have the desire to become a physician, but I also really was introduced to this idea of research. And uh, taking a couple of courses, I had the opportunity to, to, to study things that had never been tried before. And that bug bit me hard. I realized the idea of standing on the edge of human knowledge and looking out into the abyss, if you will, and trying to forge new territory, to discover new things that weren't already known, was extremely exciting to me. And um, I decided at that point that no matter what I did in my future, it had to involve sort of generating new knowledge and coming up with new ideas and, and looking at new, at new things. So from there I went and did medical school, but at the same time did some graduate school um, across the bay at, at UCSF. And when I left medical school, I had decided only two things, that I would never be a cardiologist and that I would never be a medical oncologist. I was sure I didn't want to do cancer work. And of course, never say never. Um, I, I did internship and residency and absolutely fell in love with cancer care. I, I'm not exactly sure how I could articulate why I liked cancer care so much, but I will say that, first of all, I found cancer patients to be the most wonderful patients to take care of. Um, one of the things I loved about cancer care is that you really form, the physician forms a very tight bond with the patient when you take care of them. At, at some point, you're not the doctor that has to tell them that they have cancer, by the way. That's someone else. They come to you having heard that, and, and you're the person that offers them opportunity and help to, to deal with that terrible diagnosis. And, um, and because of that, you form a very tight relationship. And really, it's a partnership. I think you can't manage cancer unless, it's, as, as Jude would say, it's a team effort. It's a team between the, the doctor and the patient. And all of those decisions have to be made together. And that part of, of cancer care is what I really fell in love with. Um, and as Jude pointed out, uh, not too long after I became a cancer physician, um, my own mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. And, and you know, the sad part of having a lot of knowledge is that you can interpret those data very quickly. And it was apparent from the very beginning that she had a very aggressive form of breast cancer. She had a lot of positive lymph nodes and the histology was particularly aggressive. So I'm a deep believer, um, as, as, as Marty had his experience, in clinical trials. I, I think that we don't, no matter what anyone tells you, we don't know yet how to fully manage cancer. We just don't. We have a lot of ideas. We have a lot of successes. But for any given patient, we cannot be certain what is the best management. Certainly when you compare that to, for example, cardiology, where we have a very strong idea of generally how to manage that disease. Cancer, as you know, is not one disease. It's hundreds of diseases. And even within a single diagnosis of cancer, there are many subtypes that have, that have different prognoses and different best treatment options. So if you, if you know you don't know the best way to manage it, then the least you can do is when you manage it, gather that information and use it to help educate yourself for the future. Figure out how you can learn from that. And as I, as I started with, think about the future, looking out into the abyss and moving out into where we don't know things and generate that knowledge. So I encouraged my mother to go on a clinical trial, and she did. Um, unfortunately for her, she did not have the outcome Marty did. Um, in the end, the cancer came back in her brain and she succumbed to it later on. 
Um, I certainly think the clinical trial helped her. I think her, certainly her care helped her for a while. But uh, it's a tough disease. And so since then, a lot of my effort and our work has been on, on how do we best manage this disease. The, the particular approach that, that I take and that my lab takes, and there's a few people here from our group, um, is we would like to find the, the best ways to identify the disease early. Uh, the earlier we think we can find cancer, the more likely we are to catch it at a stage where we can treat it the best possible way uh, and have the most available options. And so a lot of what our lab does is focus on developing early diagnostic tests to find cancer so that we can get patients the best care that we can get them. So that's a little bit of background on myself. Thank you, Josh. And, and uh, can, I, can I insert one uh, small asterisk? Uh, which is uh, uh, clinical trials are very, very important, but it's important to realize that not all clinical trials are created equal. And uh, the most important thing is to get the treatment that's right for the patient, whether that be in a clinical trial or not. And uh, there are many clinical trials, unfortunately, which uh, are not very good for the patients who are in them. They're designed to be able to further the uh, development of the drug and they're not uh, of any benefit to the patient. And uh, that, to me, is, raises strong ethical issues. So it, uh, from my perspective, uh, everything is about finding what's the best treatment for this patient and then learning as much as possible from that interaction. And you know, that, that will bring up a, a really good point that we're going to have to touch on a little in our, in our conversation, which is we know so much but we also know that we don't know. And sometimes even getting what we do know to the right physician so they can help the right patient, we don't do a very good job of today. How, how can we work on that? How can we ensure that data is available to the physician so that they can help the patient or is even available to the patient so they can tell their physician they want it? Marty? Yeah, that's a, a multifaceted uh, question, and the uh, let's let's break it into two parts. Let's talk about uh, getting the data that uh, is needed so that people can uh, make uh, rational choices, and then let's talk about uh, deriving information from that data and getting that out as quickly as possible. So we'll talk about data first. Uh, data has been uh, a big challenge uh, at every level. Uh, first of all, uh, individual institutions uh, struggle to be able to get the data that uh, is collected across many different specialties and systems within their institution into a form where it can be readily shared. And then uh, for all kinds of uh, reasons, which uh, make perfect sense uh, in the standpoint of the way all the incentives are aligned in academia, for example, and in medicine, uh, they tend not to be willing to share that data. And that's a big frustration because what I'm interested in doing as a data scientist, my early background in artificial intelligence was in machine learning, very convenient uh, for what I'm trying to do now. Uh, just think about the, the possibility of taking the standard of care guidelines for at least the cancers that are reasonably well understood and overlaying on that data about how many patients tried this option versus that option and how well that worked. Right? There's a very, very simple data that no one has today, especially not in an up-to-date form. And the uh, idea of a simple uh, uh, learning loop that I have wanted to do for a long time is to be able to uh, get data on a few hundred patients even with each type of cancer and be able to map out, as I said, you know, how many people did one thing versus another and how well it worked, and then use that as to prime the pump. Patients would come there, uh, get, uh, see you know, what choices they should make based on other patients who are like them, not general population, but patients just like them, ultimately, if we have enough data. And then uh, we ask them just two things. Tell us what you did and how well it worked. And then the learning loop should just take off as a virtual loop. And getting that data to see that is something that has been a struggle in, in many cases because even the people who want to give us that data don't have it 
in the form where all the, everything's pulled together. It would cost them significant resources. And so one request I'm going to make right here, right now, is that any of you who would like to collaborate on getting that learning loop going, which could be transformative, and there are many people in this room who come from institutions that have that data, or maybe they personally do, uh, that's something that I actively want to follow up on. Now, your second question was how to get the information to patients. And I, I already commented on this uh, briefly, but I, I want to say a little bit more. Uh, the, the system of journals and conferences that we have today is something that evolved ever since the 17th century, right, in the British Royal Society. And these journals were fine at the pace that science moved then. But in an era when uh, you can, you know, Google anything, uh, to be able to uh, and get instant information, uh, it takes uh, a year or two to get stuff published. Most stuff that's published, uh, many things that are published, are probably obsolete at the time they are published. And, uh, and most of that is probably irrelevant to any particular patient. So if you go to Google, which is what every patient does right after they're diagnosed, uh, go to Dr. Google and uh, what they get, they type in uh, whatever they could remember. I have metast melanoma, metastatic liver, or something like Two million results, right? And Google's very proud of that. So what good is a list of two million things? Because the top ones are all going to be the American Cancer Society and uh, ASCO and CCN and so forth, the ones that have the high page rank. Uh, the gems that you want that might save your life, the paper that did save my life was down there on like page 1,000. And I never would have found it if it wasn't that someone at NCI had told me that some doctor in California was doing good work who I never would have heard of. So we've got to do a much better job of organizing the world's knowledge of cancer so that it's available to the doctors and patients when they need it, the time they need it. And I have a solution for that, which we're working on, called Cancer Maps. And uh, if you uh, want to imagine what Cancer Maps look like, think about a Google Maps for cancer, in which uh, we lay out all of the treatment options uh, and then allow people at any node to drill down and see just the literature uh, and news articles and case reports and patient self-reports, what's ever relevant for them making a decision, as well as the data that comes from the first part of your question, at each node. Right? And that's something, instead of a list of two million things, you're getting the information contextualized and personalized so that it's right for you. Uh, and so there's a big opportunity to do that, and that takes a group effort because a, it takes a community to build this knowledge. That's great. And, you know, I have never done a scientific paper. And I don't ever want to. But, Josh, you know, in the age of Dr. Google, we have seen tremendous good come from that search of information and also tremendous harm. You know, and the, the thought that comes to mind is vaccines cause autism, right? And that got legs and has caused tremendous harm and is now threatening our herd immunity in multiple communities. So as we bring that data together, and as projects like Cancer Maps, which are going to be critically important to ensure that not just data, but the accurate data is getting out there, as opposed to the myths that are created socially, um, how can we, as a scientific community, help that effort to make sure that the accurate data is the data that's being put forward? Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, I think it's interesting to think about the history of all this. Um, in, the 19, in, the early, in the 1950s, there was a very strong belief that beta blockers would be terrible to give patients after a myocardial infarction. So this is the, what we typically call the, the heart attack that people get. And it was general knowledge at the time that, that this was a horrible thing to do. And then in the 60s, a, an actual formal clinical trial was done comparing giving beta blockers to patients who had heart attacks and to those that, and, and, and not giving them. And it turned out that in fact, beta blockers significantly improved outcome and they were actually the absolute correct thing to give to a patient post heart attack. It took 17 years from that clinical trial until it was generally accepted in the medical community that beta blockers were okay to give post myocardial infarction. That's how long it took information to disseminate from the actual research to the to physicians who were practicing. 
Um, that was, of course, in the 60s and 70s when all that was happening. I don't think that that's going to be true anymore. I think the age of the internet, I think the availability of Google, things move much faster now. Information travels much quicker. Clinical trials done on simple early molecules um, may be happening somewhere else in the country and you'll have a patient walk into your office and say, I was reading on the internet that they're studying this drug. What do you know about that? And, and the do doctors are almost taken aback because oftentimes they haven't even heard of it yet. It's not public knowledge or it hasn't been disseminated because maybe the trial hasn't even been published. It was just an abstract. So as you point out, um, it, it's the age of information and information travels much faster today and the, one of the challenges we face is that not all information on the internet is correct. In fact, a good deal of it is incorrect. And so for a patient to, to do a Google search and say, aha, that patient looks just like me, therefore I should do what he did, is potentially very dangerous because that may not be the best thing for that patient. What looks, what looks like someone similar may not be similar. And I think part of this gets to the tools we use to make comparisons. So if you go back to the 17th century, Medicine at that time was very descriptive. So uh, basically what clinicians did was restate the symptoms a patient had in, in Latin. So patient has the cholera, patient has the diarrhea, and, and they were just restating the obvious. What changed dramatically was in the 20th century, we, the, the, the microscope came of age, and pathologists began to look at tissue specimens from patients who had various illnesses, and they, they were able to make more specific diagnoses. So you, for example, a patient who has diarrhea could have uh, uh, infectious diarrhea, in which case the tissue looked one way, and the best treatment would be an antibiotic, or it might be an inflammatory bowel disease, in which case antibiotic won't help you. What you need is an, uh, 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 an anti-inflammatory medication. And being able to make those diagnoses by, by microscope was key. However, what we've now since learned is that what looks this, even what looks the same under a microscope might be more than one disease. When I was in medical school, we had a diagnosis infiltrating ductal carcinoma of the breast. That's just sort of a, a formal way of stating breast cancer, right? And that has a particular look under a microscope. But it turns out that we now know that breast cancer isn't one diagnosis. There's probably at least seven, maybe 12 different subtypes of that. And what's changed in the 21st century is that we're now in the age of the molecule. So we no, we no longer just look at under the microscope. We now actually look at the molecules that cause the disease. And, and I think that is where we're going to find comparisons from one patient to another to say, you really look like this diagnosis, and therefore this is going to be the best treatment for you. So um, uh, if, a, if a, a woman with breast cancer walks in and we do a, a molecular analysis and it turns out that she has the HER2 new type of breast cancer or she has you know, the basal-like breast cancer, we might suggest to her that this is a better therapy for her than, than the garden variety therapy that would be offered to someone with a different subtype. So I think this is where it's going to go. But while I agree with what Marty said, that, that the, the, the sort of formal method of, you know, publications and conferences can be very slow, and I think we need to rethink how we manage all of that. At some level, all scientific information needs peer review. It needs people who are in the field to look at how the experiment was done, to look at how the clinical trial was done, and say, yes, I buy it. That, that comparison is fair, and that result, this drug, this treatment option, this diagnostic is really good, and it, it should be spread to everyone, because a lot of stuff, like the autism thing, will get out there, and, and that paper was retracted. Um, it turned out that the physician who, who, the senior author on that paper, falsified the data. All the other authors have taken their name off the paper, and yet that information still persists. I mean, it's been, it, there have been a, at least a half dozen clinical trials that have disproven that suggestion, and yet, like the beta blocker story, it hasn't yet penetrated everybody. So, you know, we have to, we need to come up with better, more creative ways to, prove the data, but get it out quickly. So let, let me, uh, on, that, on that note, uh, say that uh, I think it's vitally important that uh, every patient is in a clinical trial continuously, and that the information that's out there on my maps, for example, which is curated and peer-reviewed, right, is nonetheless continuously uh, validated and refined based on each patient's response. Because what we're going to find, especially at this molecular level, is that two patients who we thought were the same 
are actually, if they respond differently to the drug, they have probably uh, different diseases at the molecular level, and we have to understand what those differences are and, and split that category and then uh, run more patients and try to really validate that decision. So this becomes more and more personalized. I also have a comment about uh, your 17 years, uh, which uh, is a number that I hear frequently and I believe is unfortunately still largely the case. Uh, I, I think that uh, just retrospectively, uh, a paper was published on the uh, clinical trial, the Feld one, that saved my life, and they talked about long-term follow-up of some of the survivors, so I was in that cohort. And this paper was published uh, precisely 17 years after this work was done. And uh, this paper, which made the point in its, in its uh, abstract, that uh, based on these results, we think the standard of care for um, melanoma, METs, and liver should be changed. Uh, the fact that this paper was written as a retrospective study, and it, it will get buried on page, if not 1,000, page 600 of Google, it's no different. Uh, the, but I also accept what you said, which is when a patient finds out uh, about something that might save their life, that spreads like wildfire. And we've seen, I've seen many examples where one patient is treated experimentally, uh, and a good example is, uh, is the ALK drug that was uh, recently approved uh, for uh, lung cancer, where uh, someone in an experimental study blogged about it on a patient blog. And this is, this is a, a targeted therapy that hits a mutation that might be active in one to three percent of lung cancer patients. And, uh, this word spread so quickly, and everyone was asking their oncologist, you know, it's one to three chance, but if, they're, if, they, if I'm one of those three percent, uh, there's something here that's going to, you know, stop my disease cold, and so I want to get tested. And these all across the country within a week, right? So wildfire is the right term. And somehow tapping the energy of patients and getting doctors and patients on the same network to make this happen is absolutely what needs to happen. And it's, it's interesting, you know, I, I just got back from D.C. about a week ago, and, and it amazes me, Josh, you lived in Boston, Marty, you spent a lot of time in Boston. Um, our nation's capital shuts down when it snows. Um, but I've also seen, and, and this is tremendously exciting, the work that's being done right now on the 21st Century Cures Initiative and also in the Senate with the HELP initiative. Um, we actually, for the first time ever, have both parties working together trying to figure out how we can move the science forward faster. And one of the things they've been talking about is actually leveraging social engines. So being able to create vehicles where we can collaborate faster in real time, creating vehicles where we can, you know, look at sharing data. Now, they don't have all the answers, but the fact that they're even talking about helping to support that is a big step forward. Yeah, I, I, I guess my, my comment there is that it's about time. The uh, U.S. government in particular, uh, private foundations as well, spend billions of dollars uh, over, the, over the decades, hundreds of billions of dollars on genomics research, and cancer research, and how much of that research actually reaches the patients. Uh, 73,000 papers have been published on, uh, you know, some one of the major pathways, maybe it was P53, maybe it was EGFR, don't know. Uh, but in any case, uh, 73,000 papers, uh, let's say P53, no diagnostic, no treatment. And so uh, we've got to be able to connect patients to researchers and be able to move that a lot faster. And I think that's uh, certainly something that the government can do. And another very big thing, which uh, I was talking at the lunch table with my guest, uh, Matesh Borad, raise your hand, uh, someone who is doing extraordinary work in precision oncology at uh, Mayo right here in Scottsdale. And I asked him, uh, what's your major problem uh, for being able to do what you want to do? And he said, getting access to drugs. And what he means by that is access to investigational drugs or off-label drugs that he can afford to get you know, buy because the insurance companies will cover. And unless we are able to take strong, where there's strong scientific rationale for trying something, be able to get access to those drugs so that we can try it, 
uh, then we're in trouble. At the moment, uh, the problems are twofold. One is the companies uh, won't make those drugs available. Uh, and secondly, uh, the FDA actually uh, frowns, frowns on uh, being able to test these investigational drugs in combinations. Uh, even when there's strong scientific rationale that they won't work independently. And we've seen this problem once before. Uh, and it was uh, in the early days of HIV AIDS when the early protease inhibitors were uh, uh, going through the FDA process. And they didn't work very well. Uh, the one thing the FDA decided was that they were uh, probably safe and they were bioactive. But they were not efficacious as single agents. And the AIDS uh, community said, you know, well, they may not work very well, but they are all we have. Please make a new way, an exception, and approve these because they're safe and bioactive, even if they're not effective uh, as, so, as single agents. And the FDA uh, did do that policy, as far as I know, only in HIV AIDS. And that's what the Dallas Buyers Club was partly about, the movie. Uh, and what happened then? was the, the clinicians able to get their hands on these early stage molecules could then start mixing and matching and came up in 1997 or thereabouts with the AIDS cocktails that stopped this disease cold in its track. And if there was ever a need, uh, a, a parallel, uh, this is what we see, I think, in uh, cancer where the, the targeted agents are just not effective as single agents because the cancer is smart and it will find uh, ways of getting around that drug and become dependent on some other pathway. So I think the, the cancer community needs to learn something from the AIDS community and organize and go after the FDA and get them to allow these molecules, uh, if they're safe and bioactive, and, uh, you know, but not necessarily efficacious as single agents, to be approved so that oncologists like Mitesh can experimentally uh, make very quick progress with patients. And I think, and Mitesh, the work you're doing is so critically important. And, and you have the benefit of being at the Mayo Clinic. Think about the oncologist that's in, you know, somewhere in, in Arkansas, who it is not the Mayo Clinic, and the challenges that they might face. So I think, you know, we talk about that access, and I know here in Arizona, Josh, we have the Critical Path Institute, which actually is a joint venture with the FDA, to try and move the information in a pre-competitive way forward faster. As we are looking at precision medicine, how is that going to play in with the type of work that's happening at some place like CPAT? Well, I mean, I, I, so I, I think the the just for everyone's uh, so the background, the the concept of precision medicine really alludes to what I was mentioning earlier about how the tools we have now of diagnosing illness are much more precise than they once were so that we no longer rely entirely on a pathologist looking at a piece of tissue but we actually sup supplement that with molecular analyses to to help more precisely define what specific disease the patient has. The, the challenge we face in that regard is that when one wants to prove something, when one wants to say that treatment A is better than the standard of care, that I've got a new drug and I want to know is this drug really beneficial because A, these new therapies are incredibly expensive. Typically they run $100,000 for a course of therapy. And, and B, and to me more importantly, if you give someone a therapy that's not going to benefit them, you're preventing them from getting on something that would have benefited them and you're just delaying their, their best option for them. So you want to get, as Marty said, you want to get people on the best treatment for that individual. But to know which treatments actually work, you have to make comparisons and you have to reach what we call statistical significance. And that is to say, we want to be, I'm, I'm, I'm bending the rules a little bit, but you want to be 95% certain that what you've discovered really is likely to be true. And that becomes more difficult when you're taking what was once 100 women with breast cancer, and you're comparing them to 100 uh, women who were treated with 100 women who were not treated with that new therapy. And then when you discover that, in fact, of those 100 women, only 30 of them were of the subtype that's likely to respond to therapy. Now your comparison is really only 30 to 30, and that's not a big enough number to make those sorts of statistical com comparisons. And so that's why what Marty's trying to do, which is to try to get information from everybody 
is so important because if we can get information from everybody, our numbers get higher and we have a better opportunity to do these sorts of statistical studies so that we can address this challenge of, of precision medicine. How do we really determine that, that this diagnosis, and when I say diagnosis now, I'm not just referring to infiltrating ductal carcinoma of the breast, but infiltrating ductal carcinoma of the breast of subtype basal or of subtype luminal B, that that, that subpopulation of women would benefit from this particular therapy compared to that therapy so that we really do know how to, how to assign our, our patients to the best course of treatment for themselves. So we're going to need larger studies to be able to manage the, the fact that people are breaking down into smaller and smaller categories. That, that may be, uh, though, uh, a hopeless uh, battle. Uh, let me explain it this way. If you think about a, a, a statistical grid, if you like, with number of cancers on the bottom and number of treatments here, uh, back in the day, the heyday of clinical trials, uh, you know, there were, uh, you know, 15 major types of cancers here, and there might have been 10 chemotherapy regimens, million patients a year, about 10,000 patients in each of the blocks of the design, and you could run these trials. But uh, if you literally believe that uh, precision oncology is going to break down to, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of types of cancer that's on the bottom axis, and if we're dealing with, uh, you know, targeted therapies that are going after specific pathways, there are hundreds of them in development. So when you take uh, hundreds in combinations with other hundreds, there are probably 10,000 or more rational combinations. So now you're dealing with 10 to the ninth boxes in this design. That's a trillion, a billion boxes. And fortunately, there's only still and I say fortunately, a million patients a year, roughly, that are uh, coming into the system. So the uh, average, uh, you know, occupancy of these boxes is going to be approximately zero. So uh, I don't know how one uh, does the kind of statistical analysis uh, that we had done uh, in the past. Although, to be clear, this is a bit of an oversimplification because uh, some of these boxes, of these uh, billion boxes, are going to be much bigger than others. So there's classes of breast cancer where there'll be thousands or tens of thousands of women, and those we can do statistical analysis. For the others, we have to do, we have to go back to science. We have to do causal analysis. We have to understand what's actually going on in those women and do our discovery, not through clinical trials to see whether it works or not, but do our discovery by using the best science to help the individual patients. And then when we understand what we're doing, that's when trials can come in, because then we can go and we can specifically say, okay, let's find, but it's not 10,000 patients, it might be 20 patients with this specific set of mutations and 20 who don't have, have, have them all. And we can probably do a very good job of statistical validation with small numbers of patients if we have very good causal models. And I well, in fact, that I think that, that key is a point, because you mentioned earlier the, the 75,000 papers on the P53 pathway and, and all of the research that's been going on, and I, I think that that's exactly where we have to go. I think the past several decades um, has been just an immense explosion of information about what causes cancer. And we have a much better understanding now on a molecular level of what pathways lead to the disease and, and how the disease manifests itself in terms of hallmarks of the disease that, that um, make it a cancer. And we now know that really there are only about 12 molecular pathways that cause cancer. Now there may be multiple places along those pathways that get mutated or that get altered that can, can lead to the disease. So it's not always 12 exact same spots that happen. But in, in the end, it ends up being in these same 12 pathways. And so we now understand that better. And so as we do these sort of diagnostic studies on molecular analyses, we can be much more intelligent about how to interpret what's the best approach. And so the, while in theory, if you were to compare everything to everything, there may be 10 to the ninth boxes. But if you actually use what you know, your prior knowledge of how these pathways work, that number comes down considerably. And uh, uh, there probably are not nearly that many boxes that, that we'd be able to do the studies for. So I'm, I'm a bit more optimistic. No, I, I, it's not that I'm not optimistic, but, I, but I'm frustrated because too many people use clinical trials for discovery when they don't know what the hell they're right. doing. And that just, just is so unfair to patients. Yeah. Clinical trials, statistics are for validation, not for discovery. Yeah. So when we look at, and that kind of makes me think of 
you know, some of the changes, and I spent about a decade earlier in my career in the Silicon Valley, and um, at that time we were working on semiconductors, and we were shrinking things rapidly. And we were shrinking them so fast that we really didn't know where we were going, we didn't know what we were seeing. And so we started to develop consortiums, right? So we were going submicron, we needed technology that would allow us to pick and place those devices. We needed software that was going to run on them. We're at that place now in cancer care where we need to be able to simulate. We need to be able to use technologies from other sciences and other industries to find the, the needle in the haystack. And so, you know, one of the things that I got so excited when we had the opportunity to bring the two of you on stage was that, that convergence, that way that we can use computer science and physical and medical science to improve the practice of medicine because that's when we help the patient. So what are some of the cool things, Marty, that you're seeing where we might be able to do that? So uh, there's, you know, in, in terms of, you know, particular cool developments, there are so many cool things that are happening in targeted therapies, immunotherapies, and uh, other technologies uh, for com combating cancer. Uh, what excites me the most is, as you say, using uh, information technology and uh, consortia, if you want to call it that, to be able to put uh, these things together into solutions and get them to patients much, much faster than would otherwise be possible. And I'll give you three quick examples of, of things that excite me. Uh, one of which is uh, there's uh, a fellow up in Seattle named Tony Blau, who is a colleague of mine. He's, uh, he runs the Center for Regenerative Medicine. He's a serious scientist. He has a building the size of Biodesign Institute, full of you know, equipment, lab equipment. There's no patients there. That's where they do science, right? His wife is a practicing oncologist. She sees patients. And Tony asked himself, what if we could take the best that science has to offer and really study in depth a patient how well could we improve the treatment of that patient and how much could we learn to advance the science? And he's, he's doing that and he's, he can't do it alone because he's, he's, he's catalyzing a lot of the Seattle biotech community who are doing this uh, pro bono because they are tired of just writing papers or whatever they're doing. They want to actually see what, how well that helps patients. They're very, very exciting. And I want to see this uh, kind of spread through, through a network that we're helping to build to find people like Tony and like Matesh and connect them so they can share uh, their findings very quickly. Uh, a second example is a, uh, a new initiative, which is just an academic one at the moment. Uh, uh, some students at, uh, at the Sloan School of Business at MIT, the Harvard uh, Executive MBA program, where there's some MDs who are involved, and some of the Boston hospitals, are actually looking at the feasibility of creating a commercial or uh, non-commercial, it's not clear they're studying it, enterprise that will, uh, I call it the cancer clinic of last resort, uh, a no-holds-barred cancer clinic, which will have the charter to go out and, and do uh, the latest science and the latest medicine on patients with the intent of helping those patients, but also getting the learnings distributed to help thousands more. And those are examples of initiatives that are uh, very exciting. I'll give you just one more, which is uh, there are many cases which I have seen, uh, and these are the most frustrating to me, where there are patients who are dying and they donate some cells to science, and the scientists work on them. You know, most of the time, these are 10 and 20 year efforts. They grow cell lines and they keep doing their experiments. But in a few cases, the scientists get lucky. And in one such case, uh, there was a prostate uh, patient who had become uh, resistant to the androgen blocking drugs that they were used to treat his prostate cancer. And this scientist uh, found uh, out that the cancer was now becoming dependent on insulin pathways rather than testosterone and was uh, combining uh, some drugs to block those, those pathways. And some of those drugs were common drugs from the uh, diabetes world. 
And he was able to uh, block off the insulin pathways. The cancer was now dependent on testosterone again, which was being blocked by the drug. Cancer died. He tried this in uh, mouse uh, xenografts. We planted the tumor in the mouse, and it worked uh, just as well in the mouse. So he had no option at that point other than to get very excited and in front of an audience, uh, you know, 10 times bigger than this at an ASCO meeting, he said, uh, we have these stunning results and next year we're going to start a clinical trial. I'm so excited about this. Now, the thing about a clinical trial is that's a 10-year proposition by the time you get approvals, get, uh, raise your funding, uh, get access to the drugs, uh, accrue the patients, do the trial, uh, write it up through the several years of publication loops and so forth. Meanwhile, the guy's long since dead, right? So I got up there, microphone like this, 2,000 people, and I asked him one question afterwards. I said, so who is the patient? And he said, I have no idea. It's all de-identified. So if you want to talk about the opportunity to dramatically re-engineer this industry and slash a decade out of the development time, and in the process both save lives and accelerate science, because if it doesn't work, think of all the uh, thousands of mice that will be spared from this guy screwing around with his experiments for the next thing. We've got to find a way to directly connect patients with the researchers who can help them and just make that direct and do it in a rational way. These are stage four patients who are dying. There's no ethical issues here, if, you know, assuming there's uh, some due diligence. If it makes sense, we should be doing ethical experiments on these patients with the hope of giving them a real shot and, uh, and then rapidly, uh, as soon as something works, getting that word out at the speed of light, at the speed of wildfire. So we're, we're coming close to the end of our time, and I want to be able to have a question or two from the audience, because I know both of our leaders would like that. Um, but as you look around this room, Josh, there are a lot of influential people in this room. There are scientists, there are business people, there are people that are committed to this cause. What are some of the ways that we can help you do more? No, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. Um, yeah, it, uh, I, think, I think I'd start by saying that we're at a very exciting time. Uh, the tools we have to study disease and what causes disease, and here I'm expanding even beyond just cancer uh, to all human disease, are extraordinary. I mean, we've, you know, this entry into the age of the molecule is, is revolutionary in a sense. We, 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 you know, earlier on, Joan mentioned Moore's Law, or whatever you want to, I'm not sure it's a law, but this idea that, that semiconductors could be made smaller and smaller every three years. The, the rate at which we've been able to sequence human genomes has outstripped Moore's law at least threefold. The cost, what, what at, at the turn of this century, what cost $10 million to sequence in terms of human genomes now costs a fraction of a fraction of a penny. That's how, how much, how fast we've been able to achieve uh, gathering information about genomes. And uh, we are now, the work that, that my lab focuses on is looking at the proteins, which we think are even more important. Um, I, I could go on about that, but I won't. So um, we've got the tools now, and uh, just at the point where we're really accelerating our knowledge, we're running into challenges in terms of sort of backing off the research enterprise in the U.S., and I think that is a concern to all of us. Um, what, what fueled the American economy in the last century was this huge investment after World War II in, in research and development, which made this country an incredibly innovative place to do anything. And, and that innovation has spread both from the academic world and, in, and into the industry world. And it's being mimicked now by countries all over the world now. They're trying to do exactly what America did in the last century. And I'm just, you know, we need to keep the momentum we have now going so that we continue doing what we're doing. And I think that's going to be critical at the university level. It's going to be critical to, to get it from the university level into the commercial sector, so we need to be able to translate discoveries made at universities into industry. I think one element of that, a key element of that, and it's represented here at these tables, is, is developing our students and our postdocs, you know, people who are really the future of science. You know, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my career, um, and we've, what I want to make sure of is that we train young scientists to carry that on. I would love to see this state be a key contributor there. I'd love to see 
the valley become something like what happened in other cities like San Diego, um, uh, even if it can't do quite what happened in San Francisco or Boston, but certainly become a city where uh, we're training young scientists and those scientists leave the, the university and enter jobs in the commercial sector so that they can actually take these discoveries out to the clinic. So that's the kind of stuff that we'd love to see happen and, and you all can help make that happen by making sure that we keep our focus on education, uh, both education and research, because those are the two things we really need to see happen. So I, I second everything you say and uh, would like to um, close with a real pointed challenge to this community, which is an exceptional community. There's already, uh, you're you know, certainly on, among the world's leading centers for interest and activities in uh, the precision oncology area. There is an opportunity here to be able to pilot the kind of rapid learning enterprise that I envision nationally in which I'm trying to make happen in the Bay Area and in Boston and Seattle and a few other places. And what I sense here is a spirit of openness and collaboration which might make it a lot easier to do it here than in the Bay Area. And so uh, to do the type of rapid learning on every patient that I'm talking about, it takes patience. It takes data. It takes case reports, the willingness to share those. It takes uh, the ability of, there's no one place that can do it all. And so if Mayo can do some of it and TGen can do some of it and uh, BioDesign can do some of it, uh, we need to be able to pull everyone together in an enterprise which has as its principal focus, not research per se, but getting patients better outcomes. And then the goal is to drive that research off the patients. If a patient is not responding according to the way our knowledge has predicted is the best scientific you know, rationale for how that patient should respond, we've got to understand why. We've got to go back to the scientists and say, you know, this patient just came off of therapy, failed the therapy, uh, and is going, uh, you know, back into the clinic. So uh, what did you get wrong? Did you not understand the biology, or was there something wrong with our understanding of how the drug worked? And by the way, you have three weeks. It's not like five years because this patient is going back. What would you do if it was your own mother? So at the end of the day, uh, I want all of us to think of this as if uh, we're patients, or, or future patients, because we all are. So it doesn't matter what logo is on your business card. This is something that we all have to take an interest in, and I am looking actively to help with the co-op, with the, uh, I, I can't do it remotely, but we have here the uh, Dorothy Foundation and AZ Bio, wonderful agents to help with the fundraising, which will be very important, and with the local organization. Let's put together a commons for Phoenix, which will guarantee that everyone here will get the best possible cancer care when they need it, and we'll show, set by example, how the rest of the world should do it, and that will put Phoenix on the map. Thank you, Marty, and thank you, Josh. Now, we did promise that you would be out of here by 1 o'clock, and it is 1 o'clock, but Marty and Josh have been very gracious to say that they would answer a couple of questions. So if you would like to, to ask a question, raise your hand, and I will come to you. If you have to get to the office and you need to sneak out, we understand. Mark, you've been taking pictures. You get the first question. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Mark Goldstein, International Research Center. I heard less than I expected about the kind of personalized medicine that might come from genomic and proteomic analysis. I heard good stuff about the molecular classification to the subtype of the pathology. Um, is it that the genetics are more likely to indicate what subclass you're going to get, or are there in some or many cases, a treatment protocol that will vary with the genomic and proteomic analysis. So, so I, I, <clears throat> I didn't specifically use the word genomic and proteomic only because I was trying to keep it generic, but in fact, that's exactly what I was referring to when I mentioned molecular analyses, was genomic studies, proteomic studies. The, that, that is what is redefining the diagnoses in the disease, it's also helping us understand better the prognoses, and it's also leading us to better understandings of what therapies work. 
one thing to keep in mind is that there are not an infinite number of therapies available. There are a growing number of these targeted therapies. Um, I think the targeted therapies are a direct result of years of investment in cancer research, and they are working. They are not perfect. The therapies that they offer are not always durable, and so while it's, it's remarkable when you give Gleevec to a patient to watch the tumor just disappear and relatively minor side effects compared to you know, what those of us know, sort of traditional chemotherapy. But nonetheless, oftentimes these cancers later on recur. Marty re referred to that. And so now th there's more emphasis on combining therapies to get more and more durable therapies. And I think that's where the future will lie. And it, it will work. I mean, we're getting there. It just it takes trial and error. But, but we, it will also take reinventing the system so that we can do it in a way that's much, much faster. And what we're talking about with my maps, for example, is defining cohorts of patients, which take lots of things to say these, are, these patients will respond the same, but certainly their molecular biology of their tumor is a major factor. And then when some patients respond and some patients don't, the map splits, right, and corresponding to responders and non-responders. And we have to be able to uh, do that dynamically so that it doesn't take years to be able to follow it up. Immediately, if there's a good response that was unexpected, we've got to go and figure out what characterized those patients and quickly recruit the next patients who could benefit from that and at the same time validate this stuff. So it's continuous learning and validation. And that's what's setting up uh, the kind of community that I'm talking about, a rapid learning health system is all about. Hello, I'm David McCaleb, and the question is really to both of you. I heard a lot about empowering the patients more, which is great, the research, but I didn't hear a lot about what I think is the keep element here, and I'd like to get your perspective on how we can improve that, and that is the physician that is overpowered with information, and how do we better educate them from when they're at school, so they're more open during their career to um, accepting new ideas and make time for the new the practicing physicians that are overwhelmed. Maybe I'll, I can start there. So there was an old adage that they, they taught me in medical school, which is that half of what they teach you in medical school is wrong. The key is knowing which half, right? You just never know um, how, how the field changes. And so the, I think the first thing we have to do in terms of educating our, our future physicians and, and, and caregivers is how to evaluate information. Because you know that a lot of what you learn is not going to be correct and it's going to change. And so you need to be prepared to evaluate data, do what, what we refer to as evidence-based medicine so that when you make decisions, they're made on a rational basis. Um, nonetheless, I think, I think you make a very good point, which is we need to find better ways to get that information out quickly. I mean, we can't wait 17 years for a discovery to penetrate all the way to the private practicing physician. I think you'll find that if you go to tertiary care centers, major university hospitals, places like the Mayo Clinic, information travels pretty quickly on those institutions. Where you have a harder time reaching is, you know, the doc who went to medical school, set up his own private office or her own private office, and doesn't necessarily spend a lot of time reading a lot of literature because they're overwhelmed with clinical care. And so we need to find ways to get that information out, and it can't be just drug representatives coming to their offices and saying, I got the best drug for you. It has to be evidence-based, you know, this is what the best studies, the best validation trials are showing. And I don't know the best answer to that. Perhaps the, the social media is one way to do that. There may be opportunities there to come up with ways to get information out. But it is, it's a challenge. It's, uh, we, we did talk about that, actually, and when I talked about cancer maps, the idea of organizing the world's knowledge of cancer. I, I may have said it was to organize it for patients, but uh, it organizes it for doctors, too. It's the same issue. And often uh, what we find, especially with uh, you know, personalized medicine, molecular medicine, unless you uh, just came out of medical school a few years ago, uh, you just haven't been trained to be thinking about that. You don't have the time to do it. I, myself, am personally overwhelmed by the daily deluge that comes from all of the different, uh, not necessarily social media, but all the different feeds that I'm tuned into. There's no one who can keep this stuff in their head. Absolutely no one. And so information technology, together with crowdsourcing, uh, let's say expert crowdsourcing uh, mainly, uh, when tumor boards discuss a difficult case, they often rationalize their decisions based on certain things in the literature. These are the world's experts telling you what literature is important to read and why. 
And so that's what we have to do, and we have to organize that information and continuously vet it. And so, you know, this, is, this comes as a natural byproduct of uh, the rapid learning environment that we're, we've been talking about. I love that you're talking about innovation, and I love that you talked about cancer pathways, but I have another cancer pathway that I'd love to get your opinion about and how that affects innovation. So we hear time and time again that physicians' hands are tied because this payer or P4 or another organization are coming up with cancer pathways that have nothing to do with individualized care. And the physician is told, this is what you'll start with when you have this or you can go to this. And they say many times, oh, these pathways, you don't have to follow them. But there's a lot of hand twisting if the physicians don't follow them. And in fact, there's one major payer that now incentivizes a physician to prescribe one particular product over another. And there's no way for the patient to know that they're even on a pathway. There's no transparency. So a couple of issues there. What do we do about it? And then how does that fly in the face of innovation and personalized care? That, that's a, a great question. I, I steered away from that a lot and what I, I, I mentioned. Uh, that's changed a lot since the days when, when I was in medical school and, and, and I've actually stopped seeing patients a few years ago because my research enterprise has grown to that point. But, um, and it's changed a lot even since then. Uh, which is really the real, the point I think she's making is that um, there was a time when doctors pretty much did whatever they wanted in terms of patient care based on what they thought was best for that particular patient. And those days are really gone. Um, doctors now largely have to make decisions based on what the insurers will pay for. And those insurers dictate a certain sort of algorithmic approach to care. So if a patient comes in with a cough, First thing you got to do is, you know, perhaps just evaluate them and send them home on cough syrup. Then, you know, at some point you're, they're allowed to order a chest x-ray, even if they didn't necessarily think. Maybe they might have thought right away that they needed a chest x-ray, but they can't always do that. And then down the road, you know, the order in which you can order tests and the order in which you can order medications is to some extent proscribed by uh, what insurers will pay for. And they're different rules for different insurers. And so what decision you make depends on what coverage that patient has. So that becomes a challenge. And uh, uh, there are some that would argue, well, we should have just a single payer system. And then we would just come up with the best evidence-based approach. Uh, others would hate that idea. Um, uh, and it's not clear what the answer is. Um, I guess what I would argue is, to the extent that we can, we need to make sure that if there are going to be algorithms, that they be based on evidence-based studies and not just you know, based on, you know, prices or the best deal that they were able to negotiate with a particular company. Uh, you you want to know that the care you're getting is based on studies that have demonstrated that the care you're getting is the best care that, that you could get for that particular diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a big challenge. Yeah, I'll, I'll put my two cents in on that. Uh, I, three, three answers. One, one is, in some sense, your industry has figured out the answer to that because all the direct-to-consumer advertising is about educating uh, consumers the way you would like to have them, and they go and request these things. Uh, there's a, you know, a deeper message there, which is that uh, what we're trying to do is educate uh, consumers in a, a kind of uh, neutral, agnostic, objective way based on what the evidence shows. And, uh, and so it's all about creating a movement, right? If we can get the cancer patients to organize the way the AIDS patients did. And there's an example of once where they did that, which is how uh, the women got access to Herceptin early on uh, because they were organized by the AIDS activists in San Francisco and they marched on Genentech. That's a true story. Uh, and the, uh, so patient power is what it's all about. And, and thirdly, there are some insurance executives in, in the uh, audience I think there are opportunities to turn uh, a problem into an opportunity by uh, creating special insurance products that are addressing uh, the need to be able to cover patients who would like to be treated for cancer in these innovative ways. And that would specifically cover uh, you know, off-label and investigational uh, therapies that uh, the patients are interested in pursuing and they can get coverage for that. I think there'd be a huge profit opportunity there. So uh, that's one of the things we think about in, in uh, the studies at Harvard and MIT on the cancer clinic of last resort. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to you. And I, I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I'm sure, Josh. Yeah, likewise. Absolutely. Well, it's been a fabulous conversation. And it's a conversation that, Marty, you've got our commitment, will continue. And Josh. 
you're never allowed to retire. So just get that on record right now. Okay? You're going to be here for a long, long time. Get used to it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sticking around with us. Thank you for sharing everything. Thank you to our sponsors. And thank you to every single one of you that does what you do every day to benefit the most important person of all, the patient. Thank you, and we'll see you soon. And, and, and my, my last, last two cents, if any of you need help with cancer, get in touch with me, someone you know, someone in your family, or something like that, because we can connect you with things, people, resources that can help you. And if you're able to help, if you're able to help, join the network, get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Thanks, everybody. Drive safe.